Well, kindergarten children are exposed to equations, and they should have had extensive experience seeing them modeled and related to real situations. It is in first grade where children are expected to develop the capacity to represent mathematical relationships by writing equations for themselves. It is essential that learners are not merely a accustomed to seeing and responding to equations, but that they can make meaning out of this form of representation. When they see an equation, can they tell a story that matches that equation? When they hear a story, can they write an equation that matches that story? The types of equations that I'm discussing in these two questions are called situation equations. Sometimes situation equations do not lend themselves to a solution, and so they may need to be restructured into a solution equation. This is early algebraic thinking, and it starts in first grade. The Common Core authors used the terms situation equations and solution equations in the companion document to the Common Core called progressions. So we'll be taking a look at some of the language they use to describe this expectation. One of the mathematical standards of practice is that children need to model with mathematics. This looks different at different ages, but the Common Core authors do specifically make a connection between modeling with mathematics and writing situation equations on page 7 of the standards. In order for children to meet this standard of practice, they will need more than an assignment that asks them to write situation equations. They will need to have enough experience with writing situation equations that they're able to do it effectively for a whole variety of problem situations and problem types. In a previous lesson on supporting first grade problem solvers, we specifically discussed the difficulty that children often experience in converting words to the symbolic representation of mathematics. We talked about inserting an intermediary step that involved developing a drawing or generalized picture model of the situation and using that to explore the numeric relationships before actually writing an equation. This suggestion is also supported in the progressions document where the authors elaborate on the progression called representing and solving the subtypes for all unknowns in all three subtypes. Children pick up writing situation equations for the easiest problem types without too much difficulty. However, there are so many problem subtypes that first graders are expected to work with that this can really seem like a formidable task. On the other hand, it's through the very act of seeking ways to model these mathematical relationships for a whole variety of situations, which gives the great benefit to children in expanding their understanding of addition and subtraction beyond just superficial definitions. The Common Core Standards expect that at the end of the first grade year, children will come to see that addition is knowing the parts, but not yet knowing the whole thinking about what you can do if you know the parts and not the whole. Learners will come to see that subtraction is knowing the whole or the total and one of the parts but not the other, a missing add-end. These broader definitions of the operations will become more obvious when they've worked with a greater variety of problem types. The progressions also specify that children can learn to convert situation equations to solution equations. We're going to look at the exact language of the progressions next and use it to identify specific tasks that learners are asked to do. We will then take each of those tasks individually and suggest some ways of approaching them. The domain that we are discussing is called operations and algebraic thinking. Certainly we see that the topic we're talking about is related to operations, but the Common Core authors also make a clear case that the work that first graders do with equations should also build a foundation for algebraic thinking. To accomplish this goal, they lay out a sequence of three tasks that learners must learn to do. The first is that they must read to understand problem situations. The second is that they need to represent the situation and the number of relationships embedded in that situation through expressions and equations. And the third is that they need to be able to manipulate that representation, if necessary, to find a solution. The manipulation, furthermore, needs to be based on number relationships and the properties of operations. It needs to be meaningful. Wow! <laughs> How do you feel about that? Do you think your first grade learners are able to manipulate the equations they write to make them easier to solve? If you say no, I'm quite sure you're not alone. Let's take a look at each of these tasks individually. 
In making the connection to algebraic thinking, the authors begin by stating that the first thing learners must do is read to understand the problem situation. Children often want to pull numbers out right away and choose an operation, often for arbitrary reasons. We've already discussed the importance of slowing children down to develop their capacity to comprehend the word problems. In previous lessons, we've talked about using retail and visualization strategies, teacher prompts, and visual models to support learners in understanding problem situations before they attempt to solve them. Children don't have too much trouble writing an addition sentence when the problem they're working with involves two sets that are being joined, sort of a result unknown situation. Likewise, they find it fairly straightforward to write a subtraction sentence for a standard takeaway situation. However, these represent the two easiest problem types, and children are exposed to many more problem types that will be much more challenging to represent symbolically. Taking time to comprehend the problem and model it visually will be very helpful. If the problem is an action problem, they can learn to record it as the start quantity, followed by a symbol which indicates the type of action, such as a plus sign for um, a joining action, or a minus sign if the action is take from. I've shown how this works with a shell problem that we saw in the previous lesson. Just as a reminder, the problem itself was John gave five shells to his friend and he had six shells left over. How many shells did John have at first? Well, when you look at the image, we can draw a model of this and we show that he had some shells to begin with. There's a question mark there because we're really not sure how many. But we do know that of that amount, five of them were given away, that's modeled, and six of them were left over. So as we model this, we begin with our start quantity, which is a question mark. We don't know it. We do know that some shells are being given away. That's a take from action, so we're going to use a minus sign. Then we're going to indicate the number that were given away, five shells. And this equals, or the, the start amount, once you've taken that away, is equivalent to the result quantity of six, the leftover. So in this case, you can actually model that. So question mark minus 5 equals 6 is a situation equation. Unfortunately, the situation equation doesn't lend itself to a solution. Now, if you understand subtraction pretty well, you might notice that you are missing the whole, the first value. Um, the minuend is the whole. And you have two parts, the part that was given away and the part that was left over, which means that if we were going to change it to a solution equation, it would actually be addition. So it's not real obvious when you look at the situation equation. And this is what the authors mean when they get to the third step, which is that in some situations, you may have to manipulate that representation to solve. We want learners to see that they will need to add that 5 and that 6. But as I said, that's extremely counterintuitive. Remember that the action in the problem was take from. So if your students are familiar with number bonds, one thing you can try is to use this representation. And it will help students to see that what they have, in terms of what is known, are two parts. And again, you have lots of discussions about what certain things mean. How do you find a whole when what you know are the two parts? You join them. So in this case, the tool that we're using here, the number bond, can help us move beyond merely um, uh, thinking in terms of do this, then do this, then do this, and sort of lift the relationship so that we can examine them and see what it is we are going to have to do to solve the problem, which is to restate the problem into a solution equation 5 plus 6 equals question mark. Now, one experience doing this, or an occasional experience um, writing situation equations, modeling them, is really not going to be sufficient to help students develop this knowledge. It'll have to happen on more than one occasion. Here you see other change unknown and start unknown situation equations, and also then how they can be converted into a solution equation. That means that the equations on the left are situation equations, which means they came from word problems. All right, so although I'm showing you the isolated symbolic representations, we can assume that if these are situation equations on the left, that all of them came from a real situation or a word problem. And then the solution equations that match them are on the right. 
Learners can learn a lot about the relationship between addition and subtraction by working with these change unknown and start unknown problems, especially with scaffolding by the teacher who can use visual models to keep the students focused on what the number relationships are that are embedded in the words and supporting them in writing situation equations and thinking about how those um, numbers are related to one another and how we might actually use that knowledge to solve the problems. Basically, they need to understand the nature of addition uh, in order to be able to do this. And that isn't to say that they have to understand this exactly before they start. Um, in order to make sense and become proficient on their own, they need to have these understandings. But one of the ways they can develop these understandings is through actually working with these situation equations and modeling them. So they can build that knowledge set um, while working in an environment where there's a lot of teacher modeling, a lot of classroom dialogue. But to become proficient independently, they will definitely need to understand the nature of addition, recognizing that addition involves knowing two parts or add and needing to find a whole. Um, the nature of subtraction, where you know a whole or a total, and you know one of the missing, one of the parts or add-ins, but one of the others is missing, and that's what you're seeking to find, so that's subtraction. And then recognizing how addition and subtraction are related to one another and how to convert back and forth between them. Um, that is all something that uh, is going to be very helpful. And these diagrams here, discuss or illustrate really how these relationships occur. So at the very top you see a general additive relationship. You see a whole that can be split into two parts. Actually of course it can be split into more than two parts but many of the problems that the children work with involve two additions, sometimes three. Um, in the addition and subtraction variation we now see what part is unknown. So in the addition variation it's the whole that is unknown and we know the two parts. By joining those two parts we can find that's equivalent to the whole. And in subtraction we know the whole and we know one of the parts but the other part is missing. Using these visuals we can then try to convert to a symbolic. So with addition we know that the part plus the part equals the whole and another way of writing that is that the whole equals the part plus the part. In subtraction we have a whole and we know that if we remove one part what we're left with will be the other part. Another way of writing that is through the other reverse way, the part equals the whole minus the part. I do want to say one thing quickly before we move on here, and if that is if you look at these two number sentences involving subtraction at the bottom um, right of the screen, the whole is in orange. Notice that in each subtraction uh, variation here, the whole is to the left of the minus sign. That is important to draw students' attention to that as well. Children often develop a very limited understanding of subtraction, equating it with takeaway. In reality, takeaway is only one of three interpretations of subtraction. And so we don't want children to develop such a limited perspective. Um, we're, I'm not going to say a lot more about that at this point because that's a topic of uh, our next lesson. But there are more than uh, one, there is more than one interpretation of subtraction. And if children just have the takeaway perception, uh, that's going to create some problems for them uh, in terms of comprehending the other problem types. Uh, compare problems are an example of another type of subtraction. And in this case, there's no uh, real action and no items coming, no items going. And so it's, it's difficult for children to make sense of that in a takeaway setting. And that's why we don't want to set them up for some problems down the road. We also need to be careful about how we're using the equals sign and what messages we send to children about what it means. Often we as teachers tend to treat that equal sign as if it's a signal to compute or, OK, now comes our answer. Um, this actually leads to some misconceptions and there's some interesting research findings about how damaging that misconception can be. What we really want is for students to see that the equal sign can only be used when it represents a true equivalence. So regularly saying, okay, now we use this equal sign here. Is this side equal to this side? and trying to find some situations where it isn't and having them uncover that and find that out. So they really come to see that this is a very special sign that refers to equivalence or meaning it's the same as.
The development of understanding for the equal sign is a topic of a different first grade PD module because that is an understanding that occurs in that is mentioned in the Common Core standards. The Common Core authors address this need for children to develop generalized models of addition and subtraction and also to see how the two operations are related. They also express the need for children to develop these models through the use of concrete materials and other tools that get them to visualize relationships. In fact, uh, I just got back from National Convention, Math Convention, and with the Common Core and at Nath National Math Convention, really supporting children in visualizing mathematical relationships is a huge theme right now. Um, by using those visual tools, such as the number bond, uh, combined with equations and getting them to make connections between visual tools, we can get children to see that addition involves an equivalence between the joining of two parts and the whole. And this relationship can then be applied to the more abstract equation. We see on one side of the equation, two parts being joined, and on another part of the equation, the, another side of the equation, the whole. And those can be flip-flopped, but the same relationship applies. We see uh, that in addition, the whole is alone on one side of the equation. Alternatively, we see that the whole is always to the left of the, subtract, of the minus sign in subtraction. And then we can relate the subtraction to a missing add end or a part interpretation when we see how it looks in the number bond. I encourage you to read more about situation and solution equations in the progressions document, which is 